I think it's a good gut check for you. If you're driving and achieving and pushing and you can't fathom someone ever taking your seat on the bus and you moving over, you may not be at the right headspace or right posture. Welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. We have Frank Beeler on the show today. Now, Frank does a lot. He's currently the co-founder and working to expand Faye's Family Center, which you'll hear more about in the episode. But he's worked in the past at the executive level in several churches and organizations. He helps ministry leaders and coaches, pastors from all over the country. And we met when he served as the family pastor and director of family ministries at Elevation Church. Frank is a very driven and high capacity leader. And we have a really wide ranging conversation on what he's learning about rest and why he struggles with it, about a simple act that he does every day that has transformed his closest friendship. We talk about how your emotional health is tied to how you manage your schedule and also how to put guardrails around your ambition. So I love a lot of the tension that we talk about and also some practical steps that you can take within the tension of life and ministry and family and ambition and contentment. So there's a lot here and I wanna encourage you to listen for something that you can put into practice this week. Now, let me say this before we go any further. I can't believe that my first book, This Dream Is Not For You, releases September 12th. So I wanna ask all of you a favor, everyone who listens to this podcast, I need your help to get this message out. This book is for anyone who has struggled with a dead dream in their life, who's been afraid to dream again, or who's living in a dream and it wasn't what they thought it would be. So I, I'm pretty sure that that covers everyone. I believe this book is for you. So if you're listening to this before September 12th, the best thing you can do is to pre-order the book. It helps a lot. And to sweeten the deal, I've got some free bonuses for you. These won't be available for free after the book is released. So everyone who pre-orders or who has pre-ordered already gets an immediate download of the first three chapters. You'll get invited to a free group coaching call with me. You'll get a digital study guide for the book and access to a video masterclass called The Biggest Mistake We Make When Pursuing Our Dreams and Three Ways to Fix It. So you can get all of that at the link in the show notes and the YouTube description. And like I said, if you've already pre-ordered, you can still get all of those bonuses. And if you're listening to this after September 12th, then what are you waiting for? Go get a copy of the book. This dream is not for you. Learn to live by letting go. All right, let's jump into my interview and conversation with Frank Beeler. Frank, it is so good to have you on the podcast today. Welcome. And it's good to see you, Wade. We, uh, we have known each other for a long time. We, we served together for many years at Elevation. And honestly, in the last like year or so, we've reconnected again. And you're just somebody that I've always looked up to and respected and learned from and honestly been challenged by in terms of your capacity. So I, I'm just really stoked that you get to share uh, so much wisdom today. You get to challenge us and push us. Um, so yeah, just thanks again. This is an honor. Oh, lo love being a part of this and just Wade, I, I feel likewise. I've learned from you over the years. You've helped shape my character and approach to ministry in more ways than you realize. Um, your posture, your warmth in navigating difficult conversations is something that I needed. Certainly when we first met, somebody to help me knock off the edges because uh, I was so passionate and so fired up about where we were going. I had to learn how do I get there without running people over because I was so <laughs> energized by it. But then also how to do it in such a way that was just like, just a breath of fresh air when I walked in the room, not just always intensity. And I still navigate that today um, of how to how do I be a breath of fresh air, but also bring vision and push. Um, mm -hmm. And you you've really helped be one of those key leaders to knock the knock the edges off. And I, I don't know that I've got it figured out yet, Wade, but I'm trying. I'm trying. So thank you. Well, th thank you. I, I've had to learn over the years how to get a little bit more edge sometimes. <laughs> there we go. There we <laughs> go. Meeting in the middle. <laughs> Uh, well, I always start out these episodes with this simple question and take it wherever you want to take it. But what are you dreaming about right now, Frank? That's a great question. Um, I, I recently reread the parable of the talents 
And of course, it talks about the guy that got one talent that buried it in the sand. I don't think that's me. I don't think I'm wired that way. I don't think I'm a five talent guy either. Uh, I think I'm a two talent guy. I've been entrusted something. I'm, I'm trying to be a good steward with that. And I feel like the Lord is entrusting me with more and I'm just trying to be faithful with it. And so for the first time in maybe a while, my dreaming is a little more broad than it used to be. My dreaming was always tied to whatever it was I was doing in the moment and just how can mm-hmm. I do that bigger and better. And right now I'm in a season of going, Lord, I'm, I'm in this kind of different season of life uh, where hopefully my wisdom is catching up with my energy. And yeah. so it's like, Lord, what, what do I do with this? How do I best serve the kingdom? Um, and it may be doing more and better of what I'm currently doing, or it may be morphing into something else over the years. Uh, Wade, recently I was talking to uh, uh, an author, John Acuff. I think you know John mm-hmm. or know of John. Uh, John and I were talking, and he threw out this idea that I've really embraced. It's been part of my dreams. He said, hey, Frank, I think we should be early to our 50s. And what he meant by that was this idea that, like, here we are in our low 40s, uh, almost mid 40s, and he said, hey, at 50 is where wisdom and energy kind of are at a perfect mix. You still have plenty of energy to do great work, but the wisdom and, and of time and just mistakes have, have caught up to filter some of that. And he's like, what if we get there early? What if the wisdom catches up and we have even more energy? So now we have a longer run to have impact uh, for our family, our friends, and our community, and our in the kingdom. Uh, but we get a longer run because we some of that wisdom catches up earlier. So mm-hmm. I don't know that that's happening, but it's something that I'm pursuing. I love that. I mean, I'm 47 right now, so I I'm approaching 50 uh, very soon, sooner than you. Um, but I, I love that paradigm of that like actually leveraging that. Sometimes we think of aging as something to dread, but it's really, it's a whole new opportunity of how to leverage the gifts and the experiences and the wisdom that God's entrusted to you. I read a book recently, well, not recently, a a year ago that was incredibly transformational for me called From Strength to Strength by Arthur C. Brooks. Yeah. And he talks about the, how you have to hop onto a different knowledge curve and embrace different skill sets in the second half of life. And the more we can be intentional about that and embrace that, the more effective we're going to be. So what is that looking like for you right now in your day-to-day? Because you are an incredibly productive person. Uh, Ever since I've known you, you have multiple jobs, multiple responsibilities. You are a family man. That's a huge priority to you. Um, And, you know, you start businesses. You have an amazing ministry right now called Faze Family Center, which we will talk about later. And then you also help multiple churches. So with all of that going on and you producing so much, how are you cultivating that inner world, that wisdom that that comes from life? Yes, but most importantly, comes from God. How are you prioritizing that in this season of life? You know, I, I went through a season whether it be because I had friends in ministry that were releasing books or they needed a book endorsement or uh, somebody released a new podcast or whatever, where my my learning was kind of haphazard, to be honest with you. It was whatever the newest thing was. I was just soaking it in and try, trying to grow, trying to, trying to grow as a leader and so hungry, a voracious leader or reader, not leader, um, uh, but <laughs> voracious reader. And so... Uh, what I realized that I'm in a season where I need to be a little more focused in my learning. And it actually makes me feel like I'm slowing down a little bit, but I'm choosing to go three months at a time on a topic. And so instead of reading the latest book that comes out, even from a friend or whatever, I'm going, no, 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 I'm, I'm deep diving in on this a little bit more. So there's another book called Sacred Fire. So I read Sacred Fire I by Ronald book. Rothheiser. Okay, I read that against Strength to Strength because I was in a season of going, okay, what's this new season look like? Where do we go from here? The Ten Commandments of Mature Living is in the back of that book, by uh, Sacred Fire book. And so that those Ten Commandments with some of the principles of strength, strength, if I would have read those things independently, I don't know that they would have permeated my life as much and my spiritual life as much, but I found that if I could be a little more focused in my learning, a little more disciplined to go, I'm going to spend three or five months 
on a topic, I I feel like that's actually helping me stay grounded right now mm-hmm. and give me something to focus on in my learning instead of it being whatever the random verse of the day is on uh, from you version. Uh, so I'm reading that and then I'm reading this and I'm kind of over here. Um, and I think I'm a, a trying to establish a little bit more depth. And the only way I know how to do that is to to get multiple sources talking and 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 diving in on the same topic, including scripture. I love that being very intentional about your focus in what you're learning right now. What's the current um, topic that you're diving deep on right now? Yeah, so it, it's the hardest one for me so far. Um, just being honest, um, it's the value in Sabbath and slowing down. And how do you reconcile that when I went se- first 17 years of my life just coasting, uh, not a believer, didn't go to church or anything like that, um, and didn't really have people speaking into my potential. They were just happy with, I was getting bees, and my family was happy with that. Nobody was pushing me. Uh, so I shifted out of that season into a season where quickly I realized I loved the adrenaline of results and people affirming my results. And so how do you reconcile everything scripture says about Sabbath and slowing down and being still when when so much, I won't say all, but it's pretty close to all of the affirmation I receive on social media or in meetings, in church meetings, or phase meetings, or some random podcast or whatever. It's even subtly, you just did it, Wade. It's not a bad thing, but it's like, man, you do so much. You (laughs) produce so much. It's So I've embraced that in my identity. And so I'm now in this season where I'm studying going, okay, I know there's value in that, but how do I reconcile that with I want to be high capacity. I want to add a lot of value to the kingdom and, and and do my part. And part of that journey is me slowing down and being still. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with what I'm reading and learning. I am struggling with it. Yeah. Well, I like that you admit that you're struggling with it because I think it's it's trendy for everybody to be like, yes, we need Sabbath right now. We need rest. But none of us, <laughs> or a lot of us, aren't willing to admit how hard that is to actually make that a discipline and how to rewire your your identity and what you find value from and what you find worth from. Um, And so for me, I realized for so long, even though I preached to worship leaders and to staff that you're not what you do, I built my entire identity around what I did. And it wasn't until I had to let go of some of that, that I was confronted with, well, I don't know who I am if I'm not these things. And so Sabbath for me and rest and slowing down in some respects has forced me to build my identity on something deeper and something more secure. But at the same time, I'm this is where I'm struggling, is you know, I have this book coming out uh, in just a couple of weeks from the time we record this. And I'm trying to trust God with the outcome. Like I wrote this book, I'm ambitious about the message. I want it to help as many people as possible. So how do I steward what God's entrusted to me, this message, this book, the money from the publisher, all these things that God's asked me to steward, people have asked me to steward, and I want to do my best with that but not define myself by it. Because the whole point of the book is don't define yourself by your dreams. But I find this tendency in myself to start to strive again and to start to try to manipulate into checking the Amazon rankings to figure out if I'm successful or not. So I had this whole podcast about spiritual rhythms and health and and identity, yet I'm struggling with all of those things too. As I'm releasing a book, about not defining yourself by your dream, but I'm tempted to define myself by this dream. So all that to say, I, <laughs> I'm with you on that. Because I think Sabbath is the doorway and rest is the doorway that forces us to confront those things about ourselves. Man, that is that is so great. I, I look forward to your book. I, I know it's going to help a lot of people. I genuinely believe that. Um, but I think it's going to put people in the same situation of what you're, you're saying. They're now going to have to come face to face with going, how much is enough? 
Where mm-hmm. do I stop? Um, how do I keep pushing? Um, when I break through a goal, do I keep pushing harder? Um, if I don't reach my goal, do I push harder? Where do I kind of let God just take over? Where do I say, I just need you to bless this. I brought the best. And I think part of it is, maybe I'm learning that we've got to predetermine what we think our best offering is um, and not let that be a moving target. So Lord, here's here's what you've entrusted us with. Here's what I'm going to go do with it. Back to the parable of the talents. Um, I'm, I'm not intending to be heretical here, Wade. Um, so please, please forgive me. Part of me wishes there was one other person that got talents and they took their three talents and they lost everything. Because Jesus would have welcomed them back. They went and did something. They didn't stick it in the ground, but it doesn't always mean this massive multiplication. All we do is we go be faithful with what we've been given. We may or may not reach our goal. It may or may not work, but we feel like it's what the Lord's guided us to do. And ultimately we go put together the initiatives and we go do it and then say, Lord, the rest is up to you. So I think whether the results are incredible or not quite what they thought they would be, God kind of gets credit for that either way. Like <laughs> yeah. God's the one steering that. And we're we're just supposed to be faithful. But I think when we don't define what our best effort is around a book release or a podcast release or a business that we're opening, then there there becomes this striving where we're taking it out of God's hands and trying to do more on our own. Uh, mm-hmm. But if we define, at least initially, it'll change, but at least some framework of here's what I'm going to do on book release day or the two weeks leading up to book release day, I think this would be a good faithful way for me to help to get the message out. And this is what I'm going to do. I think that at least lets you ask the question of why am I doing more? Is it because I'm not trusting God with this or because I had a really great idea or a friend has helped me with something? At least mm-hmm. cause you to gut check it for a second. And, and you may still do it, and it may not be a bad thing at all, but I just, I think laying out what we think our best effort is going to be earlier in the process helps us realize that we're doing way more than that, and it may be because we're not trusting God with the results mm-hmm. and, and the vision that He gave us. I think that's such a helpful handle to predetermine what your best effort looks like. And that may and hopefully should change as we grow and mature, but at least for this season of of life, knowing and having enough self-awareness to understand what that looks like for you, because then you're controlling what you can control, which is your input. And you know, what's a healthy input level an unhealthy input level. And then you're trusting God with outcomes. And I think that's, it's when we start trying to manipulate outcomes that my heart goes into an unhealthy place. So one thing I get asked a lot about, and it's kind of along these same lines, I want your input on it is how do you steward ambition well? Because sometimes I think we vilify ambition in in Christian circles because of, we confuse selfish ambition with ambition. Um, so can you define what a healthy ambition looks like? And, and even like one layer deeper, how do you balance ambition with contentment? Wow. Uh, I'll start with the first one. You might have to remind me of the, the, <laughs> the second one, but let's let's talk about ambition uh, for a second. And uh, I think part of it is the the source of that ambition. Um, if it if that is consistently resurrecting um, naturally without being forced, it's helpful. So let me explain. Um, I am uh, Wade. When I graduated high school, my my goal, like this, isn't a healthy goal. Okay, but this is my goal. I just wanted a stable job where my lights didn't get turned off. Okay. And I one day might have a new car. I wasn't, my my goal wasn't to own a mansion. It wasn't to like, and once again, I didn't know Jesus. I'm graduating high school. I don't know Jesus. And my my bar wasn't very high. Meet Jesus, have these crazy, uh, incredible experiences, get to do music for a little while. You know that. And then get to do other stuff. Like just such a cool journey, right? I'll I'll be honest, my ambition typically starts out of gratitude. It's a stewardship thing with me. That's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Now, it's my job to keep it there, but I am blown away by the opportunity. Like the the fact that I get to be on this podcast with you, I'll be honest with you, like that's, that's the stuff of crazy to me. 
like still to this day. I'm like, he would, why? There's so many other better people that you should ask questions of. When I'm there, and that's true and not like false humility, but that's where my headspace is, that not that I've arrived or anything, but that like, I just can't believe that. That's when I'm healthiest. Um, I know that. Uh, when my ambition is coming out of gratitude for what the Lord has done, not that I'm trying to win his love, but I'm just so grateful that I'm going to at least be a faithful when I can. He's entrusted me with so much. I don't know why. I don't know why he's entrusted me with so much. I want to be faithful. I think it does help me keep a healthy throttle to some measure when I do that. And for some people, it may not be, it's not that they're not grateful, but there may be another kind of value in their, in their faith journey that shows up that really resonates with them. Um, and ultimately it's, it's being grateful for the grace and mercy that God's given us. But the, that special kind of nudge in your relationship with God that you're like, wow, I'm so blown away by the, the rest that you give me, God, the, the fact that you allow this to happen or your provision mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. And there's something that kind of is, is your calibration point and within the thick and throw of ambition and drive, if that word or that truth keeps arising, I'm at a healthy place. Yeah. Like if, if gratitude keeps weaving in for me specifically, then I'm doing good. When I turn around and I'm driving an ambition and just pushing, 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 and it's not out of gratitude that I'm doing that, but something else, um, I mean, you can sniff it out real quickly. And so I think finding kind of that truth at your bearing point of like, I can do a lot or I can, I can be a lot or I can pursue a lot as long as it's in this frame. And my frame yeah. is gratitude. It really is. Um, and so when I get that right, uh, it's a good day. It, it's, a, it's a great day with the Lord. And man, at even bad things just come through a different filter Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, I mean, there are plenty of days where I don't get that right or I, I lose focus because I'm tired, I'm worn down, and so I just kind of lose perspective. And so I think that's where it becomes selfish ambition is when it's not attached to a response. So think James 2 for a second. You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. He's not saying that grace is dead. Uh, mm-hmm. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying there's a natural fruit that comes out of this. So out of your response to what the Lord has done for you, yeah, what fruit are you bearing? And then suddenly you may be building something that's not bearing fruit if it's not tied to that, that kind of thing that really just resonates with you spiritually, with your journey with the Lord. I don't know. Was that helpful? Yeah. You that, can challenge that if you want. No, I, I really, a lot of times you don't think of gratitude being a fuel for healthy ambition, but I think you're you're right on there. Um, that when you want to use your talents and your gifts out of thankfulness that you were given them in the first place, uh, because I think it honors God when we use what He's given us. So sometimes we hide what um, what we've been entrusted with, and we claim it's humility, but it's really just fear and it's insecurity, and it's we're afraid of failure when we step out. So I think that gratitude. I feel like gratitude is a good way. You've probably heard this quote um, before of ambition's not something to fight, it's something to focus. Well, I think gratitude and humility are, are gar- they're good guardrails for our ambition to keep it focused in the right place. Um, so I, I really love that. What do you do though? Because um, I think this kind of leads into contentment when you've been ambitious for something and you've either you've been successful with it for a while or you tried to launch the thing and it didn't work out and you have to let it go. How have you found a way to steward your heart in times like that? Because you and I have a shared experience If we both walked away from something that was incredibly successful that fueled our ambition and the Lord led us into seasons of uh, of having to release that. What did you learn through times like that? Or maybe what have you learned through trying to launch something that didn't work? You're you're an ambitious person. How did you keep a healthy heart in that? First, I'll say, I, I, I know I didn't always <laughs> keep a healthy heart. Uh, so let's, let's be like 
first and foremost, that, that's true. But uh, on the on the days or maybe the random hours that I got it right, um, I, I want to think that it's on the moments when I realize that it's not mine to begin with. Mm-hmm. So I'm no longer the CEO of FaZe. I was the CEO, original person of FaZe, one of the co-founders, but I was the only guy for a while. I hired one person. It was two of us for a while. Uh, but not long ago, over the last nine months, I've changed my title. We selected somebody else to be CEO, and I'm now chief growth officer. There are literal senior pastors that stopped talking to me about FaZe when they found out I was no longer the CEO because oh, wow. they thought they, they just needed to talk to the, the main person, right? The main person. I'm not the main person anymore. Um, and they're good people. They just were like, oh, that, I'm not dealing with the right person anymore. Mm-hmm. I need to go deal with this person. Well, really, I had got to a place of going, well, as we pivot phase on post-COVID and how we serve churches, um, the value that I added looked different than when we were starting it. And I got to this place and I think it was out of the right posture, Wade. It's like maybe one of the only times in my life I've got I've got this right. <laughs> but I was like, Lord, this is yours. And I actually think I might be in the way in this role if I don't move over. I didn't want to leave. And hopefully they weren't going to make me leave. Nobody was mad at me mm-hmm. or anything. But I needed to move over so that it could continue to be what it needed to be. And so my role needed to change. And I think it's a it's a, a good gut check for you if you're driving and achieving and pushing and you can't fathom someone ever taking your seat on the bus and you moving over, you you may not be at the the right headspace or right posture. Hmm. Um, and so it it may be my my biggest win so far, maybe my only win so far in this area, Wade, where I was like, <laughs> Lord, no, really, it is, it is yours. I'm gonna get out of the way because I think there's something here. And so I think, is there a willingness? Uh, to think that someone else could could do it better or their skills will be better in this new season. Mm-hmm. Um, are you even open to that idea that the Lord might bring somebody else along? I think it's a good gut check for you. It's a good one and it's, it's a really painful one at times. And it gets to the heart of what do you care most about? Do you care about what you've been asked to build, who it's helping, who it's serving, or do you care most about your spot in that? And most of us, honestly, we fluctuate between back and forth, both of those multiple times during the day. Yeah. But for you to be able to proactively say that, I think that's a great example for us to follow. It actually, um, one of the things I do write about in the book is we have to be willing to let go of our preferred position in the dream. Because we all start out with what we think the dream's going to look like and the spot that we're going to play. But like you said, that you might fulfill that role for a season, but it might need to change in a different season. And I think that not only is that a chance to to keep the organization or what you're building growing and healthy, but it's also a huge opportunity for discipleship in our part because it it helps bring to light any seeds of ego or like you said, any seeds of selfish ambition. And it forces us to be confronted with it. And I, I think more and more in my walk with God, I think the quick the quickness that I'm able to realize that something is present in my heart and not out of shame or condemnation, but just out of awareness so I can bring it to Jesus and say, this is here, I don't like it, and I need your help transforming this. I think that is really what walking with God is all about, that daily pivot, that second by second, moment by moment pivot from striving to surrender, from selfish ambition to godly ambition. And so I love just how you modeled that in that story. And thank you. It's it maybe the only one time that it happened. Uh, so let's be, <laughs> let's be clear. Like, so I'm still growing here and I'll probably get it wrong tomorrow. But I will say, I, I don't want us to lose the point that the, there's got to be some other people that are helping you hmm see it too. Right. Because like the, the reality is if many of us got the dreams, wh- whatever we presented for the Lord and we believe him for, okay? So if it really grew into that, whatever that is, that requires a very different skill set 
Hmm. than what it took to start it. So what it took to start phase, for example, what it took to start phase uh, with with zero capital, zero land, zero anything, nothing, just a dream, three mm-hmm. boxes on a piece of paper to get it to uh, you know a, a very large organization now that's already growing significantly, right? The, the leadership required is different. And I, there's this mindset that somehow the one that started it will lead it through all its iterations. And that's not always true. Um, now, sometimes that means building a leadership team around and everybody takes their piece. Sometimes it means that there's somebody, if we actually get the thing that we're praying for, someone else is going to be involved. Mm-hmm. I hope so. I hope the <laughs> yeah. Lord brings the the people. I'll never forget, I had the privilege of, of host, hosting uh, Bishop Jakes when he had come up to Elevation one of the times. And he made this comment. We were standing in a lobby um, and he made this random comment or it wasn't random. It was very thoughtful. It <laughs> right. felt random to me at the time. I didn't know the significance of it. Let me rephrase that. We're standing there. We're having this great conversation about church growth and just kingdom impact. And he says, Frank, you can always tell what the Lord is about to do because of the heavy equipment he brings around. And he was talking about leadership capacity of people. Mm-hmm. Right? He was like, when suddenly it's like, whoa, the team just got stacked. What, what's the Lord doing here? He was like, hey, that's that that's that's something's about to happen. It's about to take another iteration. But as I've wrestled with that over the years, I think that's such a powerful, true statement. But the crazy thing is there may be another piece of equipment that needs to take the lead, hmm. right? So the same person that builds the building may not be the person that maintains it or operates all the people that are inside of it and pastors those people. So whether it be a ministry or business, I think we have to have some other people where we're trying to be close to the Lord and do everything we can, but some other people that help provide another set of guardrails. So maybe humility and healthy ambition or or qualifying, whatever we said, we had two guardrails. Gratitude. Uh, Gratitude Gratitude and humility are our guardrails that we're trying to keep our our fingers on the pulse of. But before we go totally in the ditch or off (laughs) into the ocean, off the bridge, there's another set of guardrails that are some people that we've given permission that are checking those two things for security and maybe making other observations because they have some some value and understanding of who we are and and what the Lord is building through us. I'm really glad you went there because we are never, we, let me say it this way. We all have our blind spots. And so no matter how self-aware you are, there are things that either you aren't um, as aware of as you need to be, or you're just not willing to acknowledge it um, or how prevalent it is in your life. So we need people. You need people from a a spiritual formation standpoint, from a friendship standpoint, from a, like you said, a leadership um, team. Because any dream, to me, it's only a dream until you invite someone else into it. Then it starts to take shape into something more. So I want to hit both of those things, but let's start at the friendship level. Like, How have you fostered relationships that have that kind of access to say those things to you? And how have you built trust to be able to open yourself up to hear hard things like that? It's really hard. Um, based on my uh, my ups, upbringing and very, very broken family life, I have scars and wounds that I think may make it a little even harder to, to trust people, just being honest. Um, uh, I don't do friendship particularly well um, on a on a grand scale. I have a wait. I have a few friends. Um, just being honest, I'm friendly with lots of people. I have mm-hmm. lots of acquaintances, but I mean, when it comes to friends, right? Uh, like true friends, it, it's a it's a small handful, uh, very small. Um, one of those is Carrie. You know, Carrie Newhoff. Um, he's he's truly my best friend. And people think it's funny that a 44 year old man would say best friend. <laughs> I'm totally embracing it because he truly is my best friend. Yeah, I think and it's uh, great. I'm not backwards about it at all. I'm like, why not? Why not have a best friend? Um, I only have a couple, so I might as well have one be the best friend. Um, but Carrie started, you know, uniquely enough, while I was at Elevation, he was blogging, and I just thought he was a great thought leader. And so I would comment on his blogs and he was intrigued that somebody at Elevation was commenting on his blogs and it started 
what quickly became like a mentoring relationship. Mm -hmm. And I would meet them once or twice a year. I'd bring my journal with notes and questions and just mm -hmm. leadership advice. And over time, he said, hey, Frank, you're not a bad leader either. Would you kind of speak into something that he was doing at the time? And so he invited me in. And so suddenly the, the relationship kind of shifted to what I didn't originally perceive it as, as more of like a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it took a while for me to get there. He was there quicker. And then over time, we just realized that we were all going through so much transition that if we weren't processing some of the other variables that were off the page or off the screen and we were staying all business, that I didn't have enough information about him to help encourage him or guide him and vice versa. So the personal came over time when we quickly realized this wasn't some temporary friendship, but this could really be something. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started to kind of talk about personal because we knew personal and spiritual affected professional. And then during COVID, um, we just weren't seeing each other as much because uh, we, we were all speaking at the same conferences. So we saw each other a lot and we didn't have to try. Suddenly during COVID, we couldn't see each other. So we started texting each other. Um, and first it was just texts, you know, just talking and we'd jump on the phone or whatever. But then we started texting every day. And in fact, we did it again this morning. Three things, the best, the worst from the previous day, and one thing to pray for for the next day. And I'll tell you, when you do the same thing over and over again, you don't want to say the same thing over and over again. And so it kind of inspires and facilitates, I don't know that we had a strategy around it, but it facilitates some more vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're saying the same thing. A very productive day yesterday. That was the best. Really? That was your best from the day? And are you going to say that every day? Mm -hmm. Either not productive is the worst or very productive is the best. So it kind of challenged you to, or certainly challenged me to, to think about the day, to reflect on it a little better. And what has happened over time has been every once in a while, we'll say a worst or a prayer um, in our text and it does not get a reply, hey, praying for you. It gets a phone call because now mm -hmm. we know even the tone of that text or that one thing is like, wait a second. Oh, that's come back up again. I thought we had gotten away from that. We need to check in on that, whether it be business or personal. And so it has taken our relationship, I believe, to just a whole nother level of friendship. And along the way, there are constant reminders by each of us asking us to say, do you see something in that? Was there something mm -hmm. off in what I said um, that you want to speak to or just ask a question? Doesn't mean I'm wrong or terrible, but will you just push in? I will say, and I know this is kind of a long response way. No, it's but, great. Um, as, you're, as you're processing those friendships and you're asking for those people to guide you, there will be people that remain friends, but they're no longer able to guide you on your business decisions and or your leadership decisions because they've never been there. Mm -hmm. And so they can check your heart and love you a lot. Um, they can check and make sure your family's still good and ask questions. But gosh, Carrie is such a strategic thinker and brilliant mind. He can push on stuff I say about phase, even though he's not in the day-to-day -day operations of phase. He just gets it, mm -hmm. right? There are other people... I'm not going to look from that for that from them because that's not their experience or knowledge or it would be kind of random if I took their insight. So yeah, they need to take care of me and I need to take care of them. Doesn't mean that I'm going to take their coaching advice because they haven't been there before, driven that forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's It's realizing that not every friendship or not every mentorship has to meet the same need or fill the same role. In your life and the same for you towards other people um right. and i think sometimes we think we have to have like this one like super friend that meets every single need and that's just really really the case um but i, I really like that practice that you talked about and i heard you talk about it on carrie's podcast actually so i'm glad you went here because as we get older i mean honestly friendship is never easy because it takes intention and it takes vulnerability, but we get more excuses for why it's harder as we get older and as our seasons of life change. And what you just talked about doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take spending like in-person time with them once a week 
Although there's, I mean, it would be awesome to spend time in person with, with your friends. And I think that is important, but you're talking about a daily text that shows value, that shows intention, and that causes you to just take that step towards vulnerability and to see what it's done for your friendship, I think is it's convicting for me because I can make all those excuses of, oh, I'm too busy today, but I'm never too busy to send a text. It's just a matter of what's actually important to me. And you and Carrie have said, no, this is a value for us. Um, so I think that's a takeaway anyone listening can figure out what does that look like for you? What does that look like? Who who are the friends that you're gonna prioritize no matter the season of life you're in, no matter the, your schedule? Like this is your one or two that I'm gonna open everything up to. So thank you for for challenging us with that. Yeah, thank, thanks, Wade. Um, it's been it's been a game changer for me. And if you were to have Jess on, uh, my wife, like she she would say the same thing, like that that daily text matters, and it's been it's been good. I'll tell you, there's been plenty of times where I've typed a response and then deleted. Like I typed something, I was like, no, there, there's <laughs> nothing there. Yeah. Those were words, you know. No, 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 no. That's not that's not the friendship or relationship we have. I'm not going to throw that one out there of just some random statement. Worst. Um, oh, the somebody the the flag of my mailbox is faded and I need to paint it. <laughs> you know, I noticed that yesterday. That's the actual thing. Um, and so I was like thinking that that is not going on the worst category. Like that's not where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you, sometimes those kind of things that are just so superficial and don't matter, it's easier to answer those than to say something else that you got wrong with your kids or something you need to navigate. But I, I tell you, typing it does put a layer, that weird kind of layer of accountability to like, if you just read it before you hit send, sometimes you're like, no, that's that's not what this is for. It's been helpful right. for me. So yeah. it, are, do you, is that like a morning text? Is it is it a long text? Is it short? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so most days I would say it's a short sentence for two out of the three items for each of us. Mm -hmm. So our best might be like, uh, Carrie has had some time off and so he's hitting the ground running again. And he's got lots of stuff to catch up on and content and interviews and stuff like that. So best maybe, man, I, I told you yesterday, prayer was, I need to have a productive day because I got a lot going on and gosh, everything fell in line. That's awesome. So he may say, hey, you know, met all my goals for the day. That may have been a huge relief for him because mm -hmm. that's going to change the whole week. So it might be super short. Typically, there's one thing out of the three that we're processing via text. And so it may be two or three or four sentences long uh, while the other two are super short. Oftentimes, your worst is like what you say for the prayer. It's like what I just said. You know, it's a <laughs> yeah. thumb up toward the, the what I said was worse. That's my prayer. Yeah, I don't need to recap it. Um, but what I found is that there's the two short sentences for two of those items. And then there's the one kind of longer thing where we're excited, best, something really cool happened. I got to hang out with a senior pastor and his wife in Austin, Texas on... Monday or Tuesday night of this week, and it was truly the best. I love, we spent a couple hours together, had a wonderful dinner, connected relationally, and I just went on and on about, like, it was great. No business being done, just relationally. It was just good. I think it was good all around, mm -hmm. and so that was my best. Worst was, I, I get tired when I travel, and I knew I was going to bounce back on a flight the next morning, and I knew I was going to re-enter life here in Atlanta tired. Mm -hmm. And so that was the that was the worst. And so prayer was, hey, be praying for me as I as I come in that uh, I keep a good attitude, that I don't lose perspective because I'm I know I'm going to enter the day tomorrow tired. Yeah. Um so you know simple as that. Yeah I think it's helpful for people to see what it looks like in, in real life for y'all. My goal now is for this interview to make your best list tomorrow. So Hey, oh, <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'll let you know. Okay, I'll let, let you know. know. It's not over yet. Or, I mean, <laughs> hopefully it's not the worst. Um, oh, fair enough. It's definitely not. Okay. Well, <laughs> so if that's in the morning, talk about, because I do want to, you wrote a book. It came out several years ago called The Myth of Balance. And you said your emotional health is directly dependent on how you manage your daily schedule. Um, yeah. So obviously that text is part of your daily schedule in the morning. Yep. Can you unpack what you mean by that and 
you know, what, what have you found in your own daily schedule, whether it's how you start your day, but how do you keep your heart in a posture that lends itself towards health? It takes more work than I would like. I mean, to be honest, mm-hmm. it's, 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 uh, it shows up in the days where I don't put in the work in advance. Uh, but what I, what I meant by that years and years ago when I wrote that in a full achiever mode, by the way, mm-hmm. full achiever <laughs> mode when I'm cranking out that book, right? I'm driving an ambition and, and hopefully it's godly ambition, but uh-huh. I was just pushing. Um, but what I was saying was that you can look at your calendar. So the, the whole book talks about calendar discipline and organizing and, and understanding your kind of the rhythm of your days and where surprises come in and how you manage those. And what I was pointing out was that when you look at the day, when you look at the day coming forward, you can know you've been around yourself long enough. You've been around 47 years, Wade, around yourself every day. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can look at the day ahead and have a good idea of how it's going to go. And so, for example, um, when we would have meetings with Pastor Stephen back in the day and we'd be coming out of uh, June break and coming back into July. Oh yeah. If I know where you're we going. We would have those, yeah, we would have those two or three hour meetings and they were freaking amazing. <laughs> like we were, we had so much stuff and, and the Lord had laid some stuff on his heart because he had had some time to rest and we were ready for the fall and revival or Christmas or whatever. I tell you, there were days where I would butt that meeting up to the next meeting and the next meeting and the next meeting. On that Tuesday, I would be full out, gave myself no breathing room to process what was coming out of that meeting to see, first of all, is there anything I need to do that I can knock out right then? But just to give myself time to breathe, to process that, to think through it before I drop it on the next Mm -hmm. person down the line and kind of go through it. And so... I, I realize that you can look at your calendar and go, I did not set myself up for success. And because of that, there's going to be meetings later in the day where I have an edge to me or frustration, mm-hmm. not because Pastor Stephen did, not because that meeting went bad. It was a great meeting. We're looking ahead. We're excited. Mm-hmm. We're energized. But I gave myself no room. And so I was typically running out of that meeting late, trying to get to the next meeting and was re-entering out of having a a massive kind of like mind dump of information Mm -hmm. and perspective and vision, and I'm running into my next meeting. That is foolishness. And I I would be like, oh, no, I'm so efficient. I've got my schedule dialed. No, no, no. An efficient person would have room to process that and go, okay, what do I do with this? Even if it means all my other meetings are shorter or different, we have to know ourselves well enough to know how are we entering family life in the evening? Mm -hmm. Do we need to give ourselves some more margin? When I fly, when I land at 6 p.m. Um, and know I'm going to hit Atlanta traffic on the way home, I always hit the Starbucks in the airport. Not because I, I want more caffeine. I know I've, I'm tired and I'm getting ready to reenter my family. Mm-hmm. And so when I get there at 7.30, they're all home or many of them are home. And I've got to hang out with them and be energized and awake and not be mopey and go sit on the couch and be tired, right? I need to look at the schedule and go, what am I entering into here? How can I be intentional about this? So sometimes meetings, we need to go, okay, how can we be intentional about how we're doing this? Otherwise, if we're not managing that schedule and looking at it, we're not going to be healthy. And so I could be totally energized by something that Pastor Stephen would say coming out of that June meeting into July but that's not what it felt like on the other side to staff or even processing mm-hmm. with my family because it was more like a thing to do. And I'm just like kind of in a, a scurry mode because I gave myself no room to process. Yeah. And once again, I, I think that's foolishness. And so that that's what I was recognizing in that season. Well, it's interesting. That, I hope that makes sense yeah, or helpful. Yeah, it does because we end up blaming the wrong thing for our edge or our frustration yeah, yeah. or our irritability when it wasn't, necessarily what we were coming out of, it was our own lack of discipline and stewarding our energy well. Or or like you said, the self-awareness to know this is this is how I respond to things and this is what I will need to be the best version of myself. And sometimes you can't control that. Somebody's listening to this and they're like, I'm not in control of my meeting schedule at work. But there are things that we can, like small things sometimes that we can do just to to give a, our, our hearts and our minds and our energy a reset. 
I've talked about this on here before that one of the most helpful things for me, um, my last year on staff at Elevation was just at lunch, I'd walk around the office when I was able and just be silent and pray the Lord's prayer. And that was it. And it was, it was just like a reset button that helped me. It reminded me of number one, who was in charge of my day, um, what kingdom or whose kingdom I was trying to build. And it just gave me a chance to just give stuff back to the Lord. And so, yeah, what are those small things in our days that we can do to manage our energy and our soul well? So just kind of almost to bring this whole thing full circle, what are you doing right now in your schedule um, for your soul? Like we've talked about rest. What does that look like for you? What does your time with God prayer look like? Maybe it looks different every day, but just if we were going to get a snapshot into the private life of Frank Beeler, as, as much as you're um, comfortable sharing. Sure. A, a super comfortable sharing, Wade. Uh, so it's scripture in the morning mm -hmm. um, and typically a short prayer because now I have little, little ones and older ones. You know this, we have a lot of kids. Um, so my my early time, it was easier when I just had teenagers. Now that we have another little one, um, then so they're up early. So that kind of messes with a little bit. So it's more scripture and maybe a little less prayer in the morning than I was having because mm -hmm. it's just a different season. Um, so now I've had to hijack my drive time to be less podcast and more worship music and or silence, mm -hmm. prayer time with the Lord. Um, there's a great book, Tyler uh, Stanton uh, released, uh, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. Yeah. Um, Great book. I love um, it. And it really kind of gut checked me on uh, taking advantage of, of times where I did have gaps that I was filling with something in the name of productivity. I'm listening to this podcast. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this where I just needed to let it be quiet. Like I, I couldn't tell you the last time I was quiet in my car. So I'm by myself. I have full control over what happens in that car in that moment. And yet I was always feeling it full of leadership or productivity, or I'll crank out one more phone call or I'll do this. Mm -hmm. And so I may have had a very long day at work, meeting, 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 meeting that I can't control. You know, I'm just in a million meetings and then I'm going to be with my family. How I re-enter with my family and how I stay healthy may mean I need some silence on that little bit of windshield time and not squeeze in that one other thing because I always turn on sports radio or I always turn on yeah. a podcast. Well, just don't, just don't hit the button, right? And so we, I think even when you don't have control of your schedule, there are these little spiritual healthy deposits that we can do that can kind of gut check it. The other thing for me is this is on my calendar twice a week and it has been since um, just shortly after you and I met, but I don't know that you and I have ever talked about it. Um, I don't think it was a sermon or message point. I think it was just a statement that Andy Stanley made at some point, um, I give credit to him. I'm pretty sure he said it. Um, he said, it's not my job to fill your cup. It is my job to empty mine. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the context of what the message was or anything else, but what it's meant to me is on my calendar, I have two appointments per week that start with the letters EYC. So it's EYC colon, and then it's a person's name. And what that is, is that stands for empty your cup. And it's me connecting and serving someone that can do nothing for me in return. Mm. There's no agenda. They can't buy anything, can't do anything, can't be, oh, well, in the name of Jesus, we're doing this, but really it's this. It's not a coaching call. It's nothing. It's just somebody just to serve. And I will tell you, when I see those calls barreling down on my calendar, and I've had a very long day, they are great recalibration points for my spiritual health because I've got to shift posture and it is not my place in that moment to unload on them all the things that I'm carrying. I'm actually trying to take something off of them. And more often than not, it puts a lot of my uh, frustrations, stresses, concerns in a whole new perspective uh, when I hear what they're navigating and dealing with. So I've just said for in perpetuity, I'm going to have at least two of those per week on there. Sometimes they're on drive time. Sometimes they're in the middle of the day and they're coffee once tomorrow at lunchtime uh, with a guy that I'm meeting with. Um, not part of my job description, not somebody, like I said, that can do anything. That's been part of my spiritual health and rhythm that's mm. been really important for me. I mean, I, I think 
that's a really beautiful thing to have on your schedule every week because it, I mean, you're right. We can, we can turn everything we do into a transaction. I'm doing this for you because yes, I, there's some good motives in there, but I also want you to do this for me, but to do something that, you know, no one can pay you back for, you know, that, that aligns our hearts with the heart of Jesus and it cultivates humility. It cultivates, it's not something you're posting about, <clears throat> but it's something you're intentional about. And that's, if I had to sum up everything we've talked about in this conversation, it's the power of intention. Like you're intentional about those texts with Carrie in the morning. You're intentional about the EYC meetings. You're intentional with, you're learning to be intentional with the drive time in your car. And I think there's so much power when we take ownership of our lives and realize that no one else is going to steward our life in God and with our family and our relationships and with our soul, but us. Like that's what God's entrusted to us and we've got to move to being good stewards of that. So I think you've shared so many things that'll practically help us and challenge us. So thank you for that, Frank. Yeah, thanks, Wade. I had one other thought. When it comes to tithing, we have this 10%, you know, this clear scriptural reference. It's like, okay, I know how much to give, how much to be a good steward. And when I teach that to kids, I taught it while I was at Elevation to kids or anywhere else, I'm like, God can do more with your 90% than you can do with your 100%. Unfortunately, that truth doesn't typically permeate our jobs and the way we approach our jobs, our ambition, our career. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, no, I'm going to give 110%. I'm going to push, I'm going to push, I'm going to push. And somewhere along the way, I think we're well served when we get to recalibrate. I don't, I don't know if we can stay there all the time. I don't, I don't, it's, it's hard. But if we can just recalibrate to go, I actually believe that if I make my spiritual health and my relationship with the Lord a priority, mm -hmm. any, in air quotes, lost time that I had in productivity, the Lord's going to make that up or it didn't matter anyway. Yeah. Um, and so I think just having some perspective, and that may not mean in your 40-hour work week, you get to blow off a day of work. <laughs> <laughs> like it, that may not be an option. Uh, but I think there's a mindset there that maybe we could all lean in on to go, where, where are we not? taking that same approach. We, we may say it with our finances, but we're not doing it with our, with our lives and our effort and work. I, just, I really appreciate your heart, Frank. Uh, I love that you're on this journey of being a high achiever, a high producer, but also you're wrestling with what it looks like to rest and to trust and to be still. And I think that vulnerability is the, ten it helps us realize that we're not alone and trying to figure out that that tension for ourselves. So tell people just real quick before we sign off how they can follow you. You've mentioned Faze a couple of times. Tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm on all the social medias, F. Beeler, like I just share usually stuff about my family or our ministries I'm blessed by and, and our books that I've really enjoyed reading and learning from. Um, Faze is, we're just trying to serve uh, churches. It's a, it helps churches with their multi-use strategy to do two things, create greater community impact and improve stewardship of their facilities. So think not just using your church on Sunday mornings for five hours or whatever, and then Thursday night worship rehearsals, but how do we have preschool or events happening during the week or co-working operations that can help fund ministry, but then also engage the community different and make the church, again, a community hub. Mm. And so you can find out more about that at, at phase.center backslash partners. But that's just the way we're coming alongside churches. Some church will partner with us. Uh, we have churches all over the place that are signing up to be a part of phase. But then some churches, maybe it's not a fit or whatever, but there's some resources that we can just give them and serve them to help them on their journey, whatever that looks like. We're happy to do that. And so um, it, it's it's been a total blessing to be in a season to take all the learnings from elevation, some business career stuff before that, and kind of reconcile them together to go, how do we serve churches in a really unique way when it comes to stewarding their space mm -hmm. uh, for kingdom impact, both stewardship and uh, like I said, just reaching their community and sharing the gospel. I got a chance to glimpse what you're doing through phase earlier this year uh, when I went to an event you were having for, for churches. 
And I left so inspired of, of just a new way the church can be a light in the community. So any pastors that are, are listening or watching, uh, I highly encourage you to check out that ministry and what Frank is doing and, and what he's a part of there. So Frank, I appreciate you, my friend. Grateful for you. And you're welcome back any anytime you want on Dreamers and Disciples. Wait, thank you. I can't wait till your book comes out. I've already got people that I want to give it to, so I'm excited about it. Um, so definitely going to make that happen. And then just thank you. Thank you for letting me process and just for us to, uh, thanks for being my friend. Uh, thanks for being willing to connect with me and just for us to to share and kind of navigate this together. And hopefully, gosh, if it helps a few people along the way, that'd be pretty great. I agree. All right. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Wade. Thanks for listening or watching today. And I want to remind you what I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. What is one practical step you can take in response to what we talked about? Who is the friend that you can start texting just a short text every day to get just the conversation started and to build your friendship on intentionality and consistency and vulnerability? Maybe you need to schedule something on your calendar that's similar to Frank's empty your cup sessions. What is the takeaway from today's episode? And I also want to remind you and just ask that you get a copy of This Dream Is Not For You at the link in the show notes and description. If you're pre-ordering before September 12th, that is huge, so thank you. And it's equally as huge if you get it after the book is out there. So I appreciate your support of the book and this podcast. I love being on this journey with you, and I can't wait to see you back here next week. 